Cloud Show. This is another addiction. Addiction. <laughs> addiction. You can talk about addictions if you want. Um, another addition. And our next episode in all things present live today. And this is where we um, we're we're fighting dysfunction, punching it out, dealing it death blows. One dynamic at a time as you call and we talk about all this stuff and let me give the number right off the bat here. If you have a pencil in hand, which who has a pencil anymore? I don't need put it on your phone, I guess. 844-94. Why don't you have this on your speed dial anyway? I mean, that that would be a good idea. 844-940-2774. 844-940-2774. 844-940-2774. Hey, I just had an idea. You could take that number and put it in your contacts. And then when you've got that really dysfunctional uh, friend that doesn't stop talking, you know, and you're on the phone and you say, you know what? Um, I think, I think I know somebody might can help you with this. Then just send them that number and, and they'll call us. And then there you go. Problem solved. All righty. It's good to be back with you. It is um, a, what is today? Today is a Wednesday in sunny Southern California, which it is not sunny at all. They hope it's uh, nice where you are. But I really like, you know, I'm from Mississippi. And so um, living in California, I miss, I miss the thunderstorms. I miss the rain. I miss all that stuff. And I like it when we have gloomy days like this. So at least that makes me happy. All righty. One quick announcement. Um, Coming up, we have our next event. The two-hour webinar will be happening on November 15th at 5 p.m. Pacific. Remember, all of our webinars, if you can't watch it live, once you sign up for the live event, you can stream it anytime after that, as many times as you want. So put a small group together, invite them over to your house, and we're going to have a night of it now. This is interesting. What small group are you going to ask to come watch it with you? Because the topic might be about some people in your inner circle. Here's the title. When family hurts, breaking destructive patterns. You know, every day, and one of the ways we decide what topic to have next is the primary way is we ask you, and if you're on our email list, then you got surveyed on this, and this is one of the choices that you that you voted on. Um, and by the way, if you're not on our email list, go to boundaries.me and uh, put in your email and then you'll you'll be on our list and you can find out about all sorts of stuff. Plus you can become a, a subscriber for free for a couple of months. But if you, um, <laughs> if, <laughs> I'm just picturing groups of families getting together and watching this together when family hurts breaking destructive patterns right well we emailed you and we got a survey and this is one of the top topics and since that time it's kind of been on my radar um on this program and it's just amazing how many of the calls we get are about extended family issues adult adult children issues with parents calling about their their adult child or adult children calling about their dysfunctional parents or adult siblings talking about the, the breakdown and triangulation with one sibling and another or mothers and fathers-in-laws or my parents are trying to you know tell me what to do with my kids or all these family patterns. And it just so happens that we are looking at Thanksgiving and Christmas coming up. So chances are you're gonna have more interaction with um, some people in your family. Now, I know most of you come from perfect families, but there's a few people out there that might want to tune in because you've got that one uncle, you know who I'm talking about. So when family hurts, breaking dis destructive patterns, go to boundaries.me forward slash family to sign up. Boundaries.me forward slash family. Okay, time for the thought of the day. We always begin the program while you're calling in and you're talking to Albie, our producer, and telling him, your question and he's getting you in the queue by calling one uh not 1-800 that was my old program <laughs> here we go no 800 new number 844-940-2774 844-940-2774 844-940-2774 844-940-2774 
844-940-2774. Here's the software today. You know, we, when, uh, when COVID first hit in a big way, if you remember, it was, uh, I don't know, kind of second, third ish weekend of March last year was when the whole world just stopped. Um, it wasn't too long after that, that, uh, people were really, really talking about and becoming aware of the uh, life. I mean, other than the normal stuff, but the the emotional life disturbance that COVID was having on people and the toll it was taking. And it, it got huge. You know, it affected work lives and personal lives and relationships and families and communities and all of that, as you well know. Well, a couple of statistics on this. At any given moment, um, we have in the United States, you know, kind of typically we have in the high teens somewhere, 15, 17, 18 percent of people will report as meeting, you know, criteria for, you know, Uh, anxiety disorder, depression, addictions, and things like that. Well, the last stats that I saw, and I I should, I should look at this again. My hunch is it's, it's not less, but it probably isn't less, but the number from the high teens normally to this was uh, in, in the midst of COVID and we're back in the Delta midst again, sort of in a different way now, but 40%, 40% of America, 40%. Now we're not talking about people on the extremes. We're talking about somebody in your family. We're talking about somebody in a cubicle next to you at work. We're talking about somebody that you know. 40% of people say that they have either an anxiety or a depressive episode going on or some kind of an addiction. In fact, I was reading the Wall Street Journal yesterday that there are all sorts of um, all sorts of services and apps and uh, uh, sort of treatment emerging now that are aimed at one thing: people that would not identify them would identify themselves as alcoholics, but who through COVID found that they started drinking earlier in the day and more throughout the day. And even though they're still functional, they realize I got to cut back. And it's all because of COVID. So this has taken a big, big toll. In the last year, um, because I do a lot of work um, in leadership circles, um, working with a lot of companies and a lot of CEOs in how do you organize and lead people in a way that is going to help them get through this as well as your business. And then because I'm a clinician also, um, I was talking a lot about, you know, in the personal life and, and, and basically here's my strong belief. I think the literature and all the research supports this is that humans are humans and you're a human, whether you're at work or you're a human, whether you are at home and your brain and your emotions and all of that, function the same way as many of you know this you know you you might have a good life at home but you go to work you have an idiot you know a toxic boss or somebody um it's making your life miserable well that's not just because it works because there's other people that have good stuff going on at work and they go home and the toxicity is there so you know humans humans function the way they function right and so what did COVID do to our functioning? Now, here's why I'm doing this. I want you to have a little bit of a, a, a map that you can check some columns. If you're still experiencing some of the aftermath of what COVID has done to people, um, this is for you. If you kind of got hit with it and things have been bad ever since this is for you and if you are thriving this is for you because you know you're going to have a dipstick on your oil in your car whether or not it's full or not but you still need to be checking it so this is kind of a check check gauge for you to see how things are going 
Okay. If I if I were Doctor Evil, and remember, uh, wasn't that his name? Wasn't it Doctor Evil in uh, in uh, what was the movie? Help me. Um, Austin Powers. I think it was Doctor Evil. Um, the uh, am I getting a note that says uh, we have an intense glare? Albie, do I need to fix something here? Um, okay, says we fixed it. Sorry about that, guys. Yeah, this is the thing when you're – we started this show in COVID, and I'm here by myself always, and our, our crew and team is all around the country, and they have to text me. Anyway, um, why don't some of you guys – somebody drop by sometime and help me out here. You know, there's got to be somebody in Southern California that will come help me. Anyway, the uh, point I was making was that um, – what was my point? I was talking about the, <laughs> I got sidetracked. The way, you know, when you have kind of an anchor in a way to to check on things about how you're doing, then you have a way to reorient too. So I'm going to, oh, I know what it was, the part about this. If I were, if I were, if I were a really, you know, bad guy and I wanted to attack an area, I would invent COVID because it was a magic bullet to screw up people's psychological functioning. Now, here's why. It basically struck at every single pillar of what makes us psychologically sound. So I want you to have those gauges on your dashboard. Now, I'm going to use a metaphor here about a house, okay? How is a house constructed, all right? Well, this is a metaphor for how a human is constructed. When, when you build a house, okay, this house is 100 years old. It has been resilient through earthquakes and storms and a bunch of different stuff. Because when it was built, it was built in a certain way that houses should be built, I guess. Somebody smart back there over 100 years ago. Here's what they did first. They didn't just go start building a house. What did they do first? They laid a foundation, a slab, a deep foundation. There was no matter what happened above the ground, it's going to hold things together. And I don't know how many earthquakes we've had in Southern California since then. What's the foundation? All right. When a human is built, the foundation is something that we refer to as attachment or connectedness. You know this basically. It is relationship. It's emotional investment. See, an emotional investment ties us together okay just like you dig deep in the ground and it ties the house to the earth okay the planet earth so it's secure and it can't be shaken now you take a baby what do you do what's the first thing what's her job description first year attachment that's it you don't play croquet with them there's not a lot they can do their job is to have needs, and you answer those needs, and they get connected. All right. That's our foundation. Everything we know about psychological functioning comes from the ability to empathically be able to connect with one another, support each other, be present with one another, meet each other's needs, cry with one another. As the Bible says in one of my favorite verses, weep with those who weep, encourage each other, put courage into each other. How are you going to put courage in, into each other if you're not together and attached, right? So that's the whole thing that makes us healthy until COVID. So what did COVID do? Boom. Annihilated many of your ways in which you were connected to people. It'd be like pulling the house out of the earth and throwing it somewhere else. The people you were close to at work, people you were close to at maybe your church, your small group couldn't get together. You didn't see your BFFs. You didn't go have coffee. You didn't couldn't see family. And to the degree that you could, 
per, certainly a lot of us were afraid. And so people found themselves less foundationally connected. Okay, that's number one. Number two, when you build a house, you pour the foundation. Then what do you do? You build a frame. You frame a house. And that creates the structure and the shape of how the house is going to be secure, right? And what defines the house, what gets in it, how it's wired, all of that stuff. That's the frame. But what is the frame of our life? Well, what happens to a baby after the first year? You start to add some structure in terms of, okay, now it's playtime. It's nap time. Okay, now it's dinner time. A little later, now it's poopy time. Now it's bedtime story time. And if the witch, Tori and I used to call it the witching hours from like five, five o'clock to 7.30 when the girls went to bed, it's like, try to get through that. And you got these, you know, you structure it. There's, okay, first we're going to eat and then baths and then get your PJs on and then you go brush your teeth and we have a story. And whenever that structure got mixed up, and I'd go to, you know, I, would, I took them to parent toddler preschool once a week where the parents <laughs> have a, a group. And there were parents saying, how do you get your kid? How do you get your toddler to go to bed? We were up till midnight last night. I'm going, what? And they go, yeah, she wouldn't go to bed. I go, what do you mean she wouldn't go to bed? You got a structure. You put them in bed and you make them stay in bed. They'll go to sleep finally. And then you can finally breathe. Well, we our lives need structure. Now, children are like that. Adults are like that. Now, people need different amounts, okay? But structure orders our lives. God built circadian rhythms into your brain. We don't even let or try not to get, you know, if you're in clinical practice and I'm seeing, you know, well, even in seeing CEOs, if I got one that's bipolar or has a mood disorder that gets into circadian rhythms in the brain we don't even want them flying across time zones it could trigger a manic episode because god is designed because sleep patterns are a big part of of as you know if somebody goes manic and other things i mean there are biological your 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 psyche and your well-being is supposed to operate in cycles that's a structure god wired entity that's why you eat you digest you get hungry again your glucose levels go up and down. Those get off. You, you, you feel it, right? Think about this. There is a day and a night. Add those up and you get a week. Add those up and you get a month. Add those up and you get a quarter, a season. Add those up and you get a year. Add those up and you get a decade. See, that's structure to our lives. And that's why God wired in you know, this many days for work, and then you're supposed to rest, and then you're asleep, and then you're awake, and and we need schedules. You don't have to overschedule yourself. Some people do. Some people need more than others, but you better have some. You'll go crazy. But what did COVID do? Boom. Schedule's gone. Structure's gone. We used to have a morning meeting, or we had a meeting every other day with a sales team, or this group got together. I always had lunch with Mary down in the cafeteria. Or, 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 gone, 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 gone. White space. What do we do? I'm at home. Days aren't structured anymore. Drove people nuts. Rightly so. So we build a frame. What's the next thing you do in your house? Well, then you start to outfit the house with basically functional stuff that makes good things happen and deals with them when they don't, right? You got to be able to take the trash out, for example. You need to get the poop to go out the pipes. You got to, you know, like uh, clean up every now and then. You got to, you know, don't be a hoarder, dump stuff out. See, a house has got to continually, it's taken in life. And it's got to have some way to, to take the trash out, right? Well, how do we do that? We do that through processing what's going on with us. Well, largely that's done in relationships and with structure. So a lot of people were, were sitting around with a lot of fear and a lot of grief and a lot of anxiety and a lot of feelings about what was happening and no place to take out the trash, nobody to cry with, nobody to do this. And so a lot of this stuff just stayed inside for a lot of people. And what's the next thing you do with the house? 
Well, whose house is it? Well, it's your house. Okay. So what does that mean? I'm going to come over in your house and, and I'm going to paint it great. You can't do that. What do you mean I can't do that? You can't do that because it's my house. All right. Gosh, you're right. What else are you going to do with your house? I think I'll put a table over there and I think I'll put a chair over there. You know, we put this piano, we decided the corner, we, we would, what's the word I'm looking for here, guys? Control. See, you have control over yourself and your life and many, many things that you have control of. There's a whole column. You get to choose who you're going to meet with, where you're going to go, what your activities are going to look like, whether you're going to go shopping or go recreationing, you know, go to a movie or you're going to go to a restaurant, you're going to play ball or you're going to go work with the homeless or you, you have a lot of things and you have control of making those choices. Whoops! No, you don't. Not anymore because we're on lockdown and you, I, I think I'll go to have dinner. Nope. Can't do that. I think I'll go shopping. No, nope, Can't do that. I think, you know what, let's get together and go get up a, uh, a basketball, uh, you know, pick up that. No, can't do that anymore. Oh crap. I don't have control of anything. That's about right. Yeah. We have control of some things, but boy, did a lot of options and choices disappear. And it made people feel a basic violation of what God has created humans to feel. And that's a sense of agency and self-control. We ought to be able to make choices and have options available to us. That gives people, you know, if you want to up the mood in a, in a nursing home, I mean, you do this all the time, you know, good consultants. One of the things you do as people age is you look at every possible way that you can give them choices. You don't just prescribe their menu. You let them choose their entree. You let them choose their vegetable. You don't just prescribe this game. Right? You give them many, many choices because a lot of times as, they, as we get older, you know, some of those choices go away. That's a big, 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 big part of keeping somebody healthy. When, when kids are little, one of the worst parenting things that you can ever do is make all your choices for your kids. It's so important. I remember when the girls were little, you know, you say, what do you want to wear today? Well, what can I wear? Well, you got, here's the range of options. Okay. No, you can't wear the fruit bowl on top of your head to Sunday school. Well, actually I'd probably let them do that if they want to, but there's something they could, the lawnmower. Okay. Anyway, you give them a lot, you don't prescribe it. You let them, what color do you want your room? I don't care what color it is. You're going, oh gosh, that looks awful. Well, it's her room, right? So you give people as many choices as possible and that creates a lot of help. So COVID wiped those out. Just wiped them out. And then the last area is a place to express some kind of something that you do well. Use your gifts. It's a pickup game and that makes you happy. You go play basketball. Yeah, you get to go dominate. If it's going to an art class and doing this, if it's work related, but we got to got to got to do what makes your dopamine fly, right? In your brain. Well, those places got annihilated. So what have I said here? I've given you some areas that COVID probably affected. Now, when I was in the midst of this in the beginning with CEOs and companies, the great companies, they were looking at these categories. How can we create more connections with our teams and poor people? How can we give them more structure in the way that helps them or take away structures that are helping them from having a good structured life? How can we make sure that they are having spaces to process? One of the one of the great things I saw was CEOs with their executive teams, their great leaders, they started to put in a structure of an hour phone call with their teams every morning throughout the early months of COVID. Every morning, that hour phone call with just their direct reports. And the first 15 minutes of that call, what did we do? The CEO is going, well, how, how'd you guys sleep last night? What are you worried about? How's your family? And they processed. So that third category of where am I processing stuff and how this feels spiritually, you know, with spiritual relationships with God, with a therapist, all of that. And then fourthly, look at what, look at what you can control. Make a big list. These are things I can't control. Whether everybody's 
my family's going to be arguing about this or that, or, you know, when the next variant comes out or whether people get vaccinated or not, or whether my company, you know, stock price drops, or there's a bunch of stuff you can't control, write all that down and turn it over to God. That's what I do every day. Things I can't control, God, you know, that's what, that's your problem. But here's a list of things I can control. And my personal spiritual disciplines, my getting together with people, my projects, you know, all sorts of stuff to give you a sense of agency. And then lastly, finding a place where you can have a good time, right? So a little checklist, pre-COVID, during COVID, post-COVID for all of life. Build your house. One of my favorite verses, Jesus said this. That the wise person builds their house upon the rock. And he's talking about, what did he say? People that take my words and put them into practice. They build their house this way. He said, the winds come and the rains come and they can't wash it away. The house stands firm. Other people, he said, build it on the sand. And there's no firm foundation. And what a lot of people, even people of faith, say, well, I'm building my house on the rock. I'm depending on God, and it sounds so spiritual, and they have this steeple in the throat voice. But that's not what the verse says. It says, he who hears my words and puts them into practice. Well, that's the foundation. So what are his words that put into practice? Have your hearts knitted together in love, he says. Build a strong support system. Have a structure to your life of of disciplines, okay, and be diligent. There's 80,000 verses that tells us, you know, to have priorities and be executing on those, okay? Have self-control. It's a fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, one of my favorite verses. Self-control, not other control, not control of the universe, but we can control ourselves, okay? How about the, taking the trash out? Encourage one another. Weep with those who weep. Grieve and mourn. And, Take the, the stuff on the inside of the cup and get it on the outside and process this. How about confess your faults to one another so that you may be healed? So taking the trash out. See, these are all things that, that, that the scriptures, mental health prescriptions that the scriptures tell us to do. And this is take your gifts and go use them, which means your talents and abilities. Go have a good time. There you go. That's what he meant when he said, if you do what I tell you, life's going to go better. You can't just have this religious proclamation. Well, I stand on the Lord. Well, great. You know, but God tells us to do some stuff. And so I hope you're doing that. All righty. That's, um, that's a little longer version. You know what? Give me some feedback. Sometimes the thought for the day is short. Sometimes I, I kind of, I guess it's stuff that feels really important to me um, personally and also in, when I'm trying to work with others. Uh, I'd like to hear your feedback on a short rant versus a uh, longer rant <laughs> like today. All righty, versus taking calls. But we love our callers, so we're never going to not take calls. You know what else I want to hear from you guys? Um, I've had a few guests on the program. Every now and then, um, we had uh, Michael Jr. came on one day. We had um, we had uh, Kate came on and talked about dating. Um, we had uh, Bishop Jakes came on. That was a great, great, great set. We've had a few. Normally, I don't do that. Um, I'd like to hear. Do you like the episodes where we have guests? My daughters, or one of my daughters came on. Lucy came on once. Tori came on once. Um, do you like it when I have guests and who you'd like to see? So we'll call them. We'll say, you know, Mary from Dallas told us to call you. So we'll do that. Okay. Uh, let's uh, go and talk to a Kate from California about anxiety. She's calling us uh, from Facebook. Kate, welcome to the program. Hi, thank you. You're welcome. Where do you live in Hello? California? Are you are you my neighbor? Sacramento area. Sacramento. Okay, you're up the road. 
kind of a long way. Anyway, yeah. How can I how can I help you? How's your air quality up there, by the way? Did y'all get it all? Is it getting better? It finally cleared out a little bit. Getting better. I was feeling for you up there. It was tough for a while. Yeah. Yeah, it was nasty so tell, for a while. Yeah. Tell me. <laughs> tell me how I can help you. Um. So we we went through my family a series of. I mean, hello, COVID, um, but changes surrounding that kind of like what you were talking about in the intro. Mm-hmm. Um, but with, um, you know, we went from our kids were in private school and now I'm homeschooling full time. We had a crazy situation with neighbors and we had to move very suddenly and just what? a lot of big factors. Whoa, 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 My husband whoa, had whoa, a job whoa. change. Wait a minute. Stop. How can your neighbors get so crazy that you have to move? What it was like crazy music screening, lots of, it was like very suddenly like not safe. So we just, we, we had to move. Um, wow. That's a big deal. So we're, yeah. Um, so now we're in, you know, we're in a new place and we're, we're safe. We're good. We're settled. I'm still homeschooling, but that's kind of in its groove. Um, but my anxiety is just won't. Mm. calm down um mm-hmm. so i'm still like waking, waking with panic attacks and um Hi, is this that, the first time um, is this the first time you've ever had anxiety attacks yeah no, never had, how old are you i'm 35 35 wow that's really good i mean it's uh you know I mean, a I've lot had of times, anxiety but not like attacks like this yeah, is it is it kind of full blown panic attacks, and you get the whole bit the like the hyperventilating and mm-hmm. the feeling yeah. like you're going to die and all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, what kind of treatment have you had? Um, so I started some counseling about six months ago, and it was helping for a while, and then it got worse again, and like the there's I have like noise triggers and. Whatnot. So I'm working with a counselor. Um, I'm wondering if there's like any like down and dirty like way to expedite to get. I mean, like especially this last week, the like. Okay, you 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 laugh there. You sort of laugh for a second. And I lost some words. You're working with a counselor, and what down and dirty? Um, <laughs> there's a way like a. Okay, a quick. A fix. way to just like get help my my. Yeah, or like for my body to just figure out that like we're okay now. Like I hear the garbage truck yeah. go by and my I just yeah yeah out. yeah 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 like yeah you know yeah um, yeah. It, well, let, let me ask you this: What are you working on? What are you working on with the counselor? Is this a psychologist? Yeah, he's a Christian counselor. Yeah, but there's Christian um, counselors from lay counselors all the way to psychiatrists, psychologists, and everything in between. What? Um, he has lots of degrees on as well. <laughs> okay, doctor thermometer. Know. All right. So what? What? Um, like, what are you doing? What are you working on in the counseling? Um, working on like from the old house. We've been talking about uh, like what happened there and like the hard stuff there. We talked a little about family history stuff, and we've talked about things as they've come up. Those new things. I got a new diagnosis. I've got a just other health stuff and what other health stuff do you so kind of the gamut What's um that? it's a new di- i have it's a um this like a like i have tumors that grow so it's it's dealing with that that's the new diagnosis so I, nothing i'm sorry with, like mental health stuff um, okay well, all right. you went out on me so i couldn't quite hear what it was but you have some kind of health issue i'm sorry um, is it is it affecting your your functioning? I mean, you feel crummy. You can't do stuff you used to do. Um. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's lots and, and lots of pain. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Um. So basically, the counseling is kind of talking about this stuff. You're processing things. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay. And what, what does the counselor say about specifically about the panic attacks, how he or she is wants you to address those? Um, we haven't spent much time talking specifically about the panic attacks. They were, they like, they were bad in the beginning and then it got better. And then it's like, they came back all of a sudden. All right. So first thing I always do, you know, it's always good practice is when somebody's in counseling to go back to your counselor and, and tell them, say, you know what, it helped Mm -hmm. for a little while, but my anxiety is growing. I'm having panic attacks now. Tell me exactly what's our plan for dealing with these panic attacks, as well as all this other stuff. Now, you know, processing life and family issues and all that kind of stuff is really, really important. But also we need, Mm -hmm. you need, you probably need some sort of an idea of, is that going to help my anxiety? And what do I do? What do I do in the meantime? Okay. That's number one. Secondly, Mm -hmm. I would ask the counselor, you know, do you, what is your, what is your method of dealing with panic attacks? Anxiety attacks are very treatable. Okay. And I would just talk to him about that. And I would ask him, say, is that really something that you, you know, have a lot of experience in, and in addition, maybe to our processing, Mm -hmm. do we, do I need a specialist that just does anxiety attacks? And that's a good question to ask. So that's where I would start because there are very specific treatments for anxiety attacks. By the way, I'm going to gift you when you get off, um, when, when, um, when I put you on hold, I want you to talk to Alby. I have a two hour webinar that's going to address anxiety and panic attacks very directly, way more than I can do now on this call. Okay. And I'm going to gift that to you and others can find it by going to boundaries.me forward slash anxiety. Cause there's very, very, I mean, we know how to treat panic attacks. Okay. So there is help for this and we'll okay. give you a lot of hope, but okay. quick, quick question. Has he talked about medicine at all? I tried medicine, but I didn't feel like it was working. And so I stopped because I was having all side effects and, what, and I didn't what feel did, like it was actually helping with that. And, what did you try? Um, it was, oh, what was it? Zoloft, is that a thing? Yeah, yeah. And yeah, uh, yeah. how long did you take it? Um, like two months. A few months. Okay. Were you seeing a psychiatrist? Two months. Just my general practitioner doctor. Okay. Another recommendation I would have, I would want you to mm-hmm. go see a psychiatrist in the same way I go see okay. my regular doctor and my regular doctor said, you know what, you got to go see, you, you got to go see the gastro guy because blah, 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 or you got to go see the neurologist or you got to go see, because, you know, Mm-hmm. Family practice doctors do know a lot about the metabolic and you know brain stuff that can go into panic attacks, but what psychiatrists do is that's all they deal with, and so they tend to know mm-hmm. the titrations of medicines that will get to it, and also the the ones that can 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 best deal with with not having the side effects you're having, and and here's why I say this. Okay, it's not it's not no again I'm not talking about happy pills. I'm not talking about tranquilizers and, you know, take a Xanax yeah. every time you get, that's not what I'm talking about. Cause those are addictive and those can, can be problematic yeah. when not, not used well, but the class of medicines you're talking about, sometimes people have anxiety attacks that are secondary mm-hmm. and kind of part of sort of the same brain systems that, that, that work with depression And this class of antidepressants restores brain chemistry and it takes a little while to do mm-hmm. it. It's going to take a few weeks and it can be enormously beneficial. So I would, I'd okay. recommend that. Okay. Now, having said okay. all of that, having said all of that, I'm going to give you a couple of things for just things that are really good to think about. What's happening in a panic yeah. attack is you will get a trigger, right? Mm-hmm a noise or whatever. Basically, we could talk about all the causes you're working on that in therapy. A lot of this has to do with, a lot of this has to do with feeling out of control. I mean, stuff has happened that you don't have control of. 
right? So what that does is it starts the, you know, the amygdala and a bunch of other, you know, stuff in your brain to start shooting off signals. Something bad is happening. All right. And your mm-hmm. shoot, your body is shooting off all of these hormones and a bunch of other stuff that's putting it into an alerted state. All right. Now, when the, the way the biochemistry mm-hmm. of that works is that state comes with a feeling of awful dread. Correct. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Awful dread. Something awful is yeah. happening. Okay, that's mm-hmm. the way God designed you. Because if a train is coming at you, you ought to dread it, right? Now, what that goes into yeah. is it it triggers. I got to do something about this, right? Fight or flight. I got to jump off the track, mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. I got to run, or there's something I got to do to stop this, right? And so it triggers. Right. It triggers it. So what can you do to stop it? Well, generally, people's brains will invent an answer that gives them a sense of control. Oh, it must be the plane's going to crash. What am I going to do? Okay, I'll get off the plane. I'm not going to fly anymore. And see, that gives them a sense of control. Mm-hmm. It's not going to solve the problem. It just develops more and more of a, and then they start to worry, and then they start to obsess. And what if, what if, what if, what if? I bet if you wrote down all the what ifs right. and go through your brain, there wouldn't be enough lines on the pad to write it all down, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so you said yeah. something profound early in this call. You said something about is there a quick fix to make trick my body or something into kind of what? Okay, here's the deal. You're exactly uh-huh. right. You're exactly right. Your body has learned somewhere. Something bad is happening. Mm -hmm. When you Mm -hmm. feel that, your brain starts to agree with it and go, oh, crap, something bad is happening. And then you get afraid of something bad is happening. And that ups the anxiety. Now I'm afraid of, oh, oh my gosh, I'm going to panic. today. Oh, here it comes. Here it comes. Here it comes. Here it comes. Right. And it escalates. Mm -hmm. So here's what we got to do. We got to retrain your brain that your body doesn't know what it's talking about. Okay. No, I want you to hear that. We're going to retrain your brain that your body doesn't know what it's talking Mm -hmm. about. Meaning you're going to get feelings inside. And instead of using those as a trigger to start to worry, we're going to normalize that feeling. And, okay. oh, there it comes again. There's the, okay, I've got tightness in my chest. Wow, that mm-hmm. my heart is racing. There it is. Now you're noticing while all this is happening, I'm not dying. It's uncomfortable, but it's okay. And we're just going to, you're noticing it. And then you're going to divert your attention. And you're going to get involved in life. Now this is, I'm going to walk you through this and you're a good counselor you know, starts to address these things in this area might be very, very helpful to you. But what you're going to do is you're going to normalize this to where that's just a normal feeling. It doesn't mean anything. I'm going to ignore it instead of engage with it. And then your brain's going to learn, damn it, I'm telling you to, that we're having a crisis here. And you're going, no, we're not. And it's okay, fine. I won't talk to you more. And then your brain is going to learn to calm down when it hears noises. But it's very hard to do this. Okay. That's one. I I would have you working on some relaxation exercises and some mindfulness stuff. And the other thing is Mm -hmm. that there's some, there's some thinking patterns. They call it, you know, the cognitive therapists talk a lot about this. Mm -hmm. You have learned to, when you're feeling this, to think very catastrophic thoughts the house is going to burn mm-hmm. down. There's a bomb. I'm going to die. This health thing's never going to get better. Right. All this kind of stuff. And there's right. a lot of ways to work with those. It's all in the anxiety webinar. So I'm going to give that to you. But that's kind of some of the categories I would want you to address. All right. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. 
I hope that's helpful. I know it's awful. Let me give you one little hopeful story. Um, okay. Well, I mean, I could tell you a million because I've treated so many people with <laughs> panic attacks. Um, I didn't. Uh, <laughs> well, um, what I started to say, my my daughter has some because she got she got locked mm -hmm. in a in an airplane uh, bathroom during horrible turbulence and started to develop oh. anxiety disorder oh, yeah, no. when she was like seven. Oh. In fact, you could go back to the episode. It's probably in the archives here where I interviewed her. And it was so cool mm -hmm. because I taught her these methods of dealing with her panic attacks. Like she mm -hmm. would go on sleepovers and call yeah. us, come get me. It's just 10 o'clock at night. Come get me, come get me, come get me. And, and I had yeah. to really, really yeah. teach her, you know, we're not going to give into this and all this, and, but I taught her this, this formula and here's what it was. Feel it. Just let yourself feel it. Let it come. There it is. You can't stop it. it the part of the brain that says stop yeah. it is not connected to the part of the brain that's generating it. So it doesn't help. So just feel yeah. it. Okay. Ignore it. And choose to get involved in whatever you're going to do. And so anyway, she, she works as fan. Her panic attacks okay. go away. We're yeah. on vacation. We're on vacation. And her cousin's having anxiety attacks about the boat, getting on the boat to go ski. And it was so cool. Uh -huh. I watched this. I watched this 12-year-old girl sit down with her 10-year-old cousin and say, okay, here's what you do. You feel it and then you ignore, oh. accept it and ignore okay. it and then you go skiing. And it works. It works. So anyway, mm. get a good counselor okay. or, or, or talk to your counselor about getting something direct. Mm -hmm. If he or she can't do it, in addition to maybe continuing to do what you do, you might want to see somebody takes you a specific path of this. I want you to see a psychiatrist okay. and then I want you to listen to the webinar because it's going to instruct you on this. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Let you got it. Let Albie talk to you because he'll, he'll hook you up for the rest of you. Um, you know, we have uh, workshops. If you go to boundaries.me and you go to the store and you look at the workshops section, I have two hour webinars um, that we've done on depression, on anxiety and panic disorders, on overcoming emotional struggles, on restoring your marriage, on uh, changing your dating life. There's a bunch of these, these workshops on there. And so go check this out. All righty. Um, let's go back to the phones and talk to Kathleen, who is a Facebook listener. Facebook is back. Facebook had a big outage the other day. We lost our Facebook people. Um, <laughs> Kathleen, welcome to the program. Hello, Dr. Cloud. Thank you. You are so welcome. Thanks for being part of our tribe here. Yes, sir. For a lot of years. <laughs> I, uh, Changes That Heal is the first book I ever read. Oh, wow. Found it about that? tremendously. Of course, then I had to read Boundaries. <laughs> Well, you know why we wrote I'm calling boundaries? Today. <laughs> go, go ahead. My daughter is uh, in her late 20s, and she's been in a 10-year relationship living with her boyfriend, and he broke up with her um, hmm. a week or so ago. And... Um, it's been tough on me emotionally. <laughs> mm. I'm trying. We live in different states. She lives in Texas. I live in Arizona. She doesn't have any really family support. She has a few friends in Texas. I'm trying my best to keep myself in reserve. I want to support her. I want to be available to her, but I yeah. don't want to overstep that. So, and, but emotionally, I am having a tough time mm. knowing she's hurting. And I don't know if that's because of past trauma in my life that I identify too closely with what's going on with her. Mm -hmm. So it's kind what, of. What, what, might that, what might that be? What might the trauma be that? 
would cause you to to over identify with her? Um, I was in my third marriage and he mm. met somebody else and he dumped me and rejected me. You know, and that okay. was, that's when I first read Changes That Heal, actually, and uh, Necessary Endings and those kinds of things. Oh, and good. I know that my daughter has experienced trauma. She has anxiety disorder as well. And I know that okay. in order, I can't be like overbearingly helpful because that will All right, well, affect well, let's, her anxiety. Well, overbearing and helpful are oxymorons, right? So it's not helpful to be overbearing. <laughs> but <laughs> but let, for, first of all, it sounds like you've gotten better. Right. Oh yes, yes, and I. Okay. Through I've read nine of your books, and I'm yeah. Uh, okay. Considering the trauma I've had in my life, I function very in a very healthy manner. Go, girl. Let's let's just um let's just uh let's just applaud that for a second. All right, you got better. You went through three of these. She's just on her first one. Hopefully, her last one. It goes bad. <laughs> but look at look what happened here. Now I'm gonna ask you a second question. How did that happen? How'd you get better? How did I get well faith in God and I and I applied what I learned through like changes at Hill. I had a lot yeah. of childhood trauma. Yeah, you worked and, on that. Um, Who'd you work on that with? Who'd you work on that with? Kind of just you and me. I read your book, Changes That Heal. I didn't just read the book. I took a notebook and I studied what you said. And okay. I identified things in my life that was causing okay. me to. Okay. And who, who that's great. You learn, you learn the dynamics. I mean, that's really important. That's why we write books, right? And who did, did you talk to anybody? Did you have a counselor? Did you have a friend? Who'd you process it with? Who supported you? Actually, during that time, pretty much it was just me you and god at the time i i really well at the time though but I who later i mean i have friends I, if you're still isolated and just me you and god then you're not doing everything no the i have a lot of friends no that you I process have, I, with I mean, right right my my current husband uh, you know i okay. process things with him all right so know. great i'm trying to illustrate um, something here you number one you got better OK, so yeah. some amount of pain there caused you to have a wake up call and say, I don't want to live this way. I'm going to get better. Number two, you reached outside of yourself to some help. You got some help from me in the books and you got some help from supportive friends and all that kind of stuff. And number three, you did the work. All right. Now, here's yeah. why I'm telling you that here's why I'm telling you this. Because that is the best way to help your daughter not to be any of those things but to be a bridge for her to go do what you did and what i would do is i'd say you know what i went through exactly that you never even knew him or maybe is that her father was the first one your her father no my okay. second husband was her father okay so, sweetheart, I've been through this three times, you know, and I, I understand the pain you're going through. But what I found was, especially after the first one, that if I didn't, if I didn't, if I didn't work on me and heal and get connected to some people and some information that could help me, I didn't do that. And I repeated it. And then I repeated it. And, and that's what I want you to yep. do. And so the best way that you can help her, it's not overbearing to, to help somebody get to help because she's not going to do this by herself, thinking through it on her own by herself or on her own with her mother. I, I have, I've just, I don't want to say never because it's probably not true, but I have never seen a parent of an adult child be the primary source where they 
cure some significant dysfunction. They've got to get outside right. of well, the family did, system. She did make an appointment with a counselor, and she did that perfect. all on her own. Perfect. Perfect, so perfect, that, perfect. That's there you go. Step. All right, so every time you start to get anxious and you start to fear, remember, okay, I'm probably remembering how bad it was for me. I need to talk about this and remember and process that a little bit. And then I need to realize I got over it by addressing what I needed to address. The only way she's going to get over it is to do that. And I got to let her do that. And I'm going to pray for her and support her. But this is her life and she's got to do that. And you continue to say that. And that's going to go into your brain as well as yeah. hers. The decision yeah, to have that, a child. That's what, go ahead. That You hit the nail on the head. That's, I'm over-identifying with her pain, right. which is causing me to have anxiety. And that's feel right. very, very sad. That's right. So go back into your support system. Don't do this on your own. Come on. You got to be talking to some people. You go back. And say, I wonder what yeah. this is triggering in me. I remember how bad it was. And you're going to start talking about that. You're going to squeeze the sponge and get all that old stuff out of you. And then you're going to be able to look at her just like a doctor does, a little more than that, or a little different than that. But, you know, when I'm treating somebody, I'm only going to be able to be helpful to them or even a friend when I realize, but this is their life, not mine. Then I can be empathic but I don't lose myself and my ability to help because once we over identify now we're, we're drowning, trying to help the drowning person. That's why you put them in the airplane. You put the oxygen on you first and then you can stay strong to help them. So you've probably got a little more kind of stuff to process too, but I love your, love your, uh, your care for your, your daughter and wanting her to get better. That's good. You just need to make sure you're helping her understand and you understand this is her life and she's the only one that can do the hard work. Right. I can't do it for, I can't fix it for. Can't do it for. <laughs> can't fix it for. I wish we could. I, I'm going to um, gift you and her, let Albie uh, hook you up with this. We have a webinar called Restoring Your Brokenness. And I think that will help her as well as I want to gift her the the webinar on overcoming divorce because she's gone through a divorce, whether she calls it that or not. So right. hope that right. hope that helps, Kathleen. Thank you for your call and thanks for being in the tribe Thank for you, a Dr. long time. Wow. Really, really value right. you. Um, just how you hung with it and you're doing great. So keep it going as we. Um, as you probably heard me say, I don't know where I heard this, but God, is it ever true? The decision to have a child is the decision to have your heart walk outside of your body for the rest of your life. I mean, you just look out there and no, that is my heart. Well, don't do that. No, do this instead. Oh, you felt it. But we do. <laughs> we got to keep the boundaries like that's her problem, not mine. It's the only way you can ever be helpful. The only way you can ever be helpful. And it starts when they're sticking, I don't know, what, six months old, when you're getting to that point where, you know, they're got to help them learn to sleep through the night and they cry a little longer than you feel comfortable with. Ah, I got to go pick them up. And, and then they get to be a toddler and they, I'll never forget the first time um, I put Olivia in timeout. And she was, screaming like screaming and we're in the other room <laughs> toward toward saying i got okay that's long enough that's long enough i gotta go get her i said no not yet and it was wrenching her heart you know to hear I, she goes no that's long enough i said tor it's not long enough and here's why she's still screaming out of anger she's still protesting wait and you're gonna hear that anger go to sobbing is, and it's going to give in to when she realizes this limit is not going to move. She's still trying to get us to come get her out. Okay. She hasn't given up that she can control the limit. When she learns the limit isn't moving, then she's going to get really sad. And then we go in there. And after another minute or so, nah, 
that turned into. <laughs> okay. She's learned. She's not in control of the universe. But see, how hard is it to watch a kid go through stuff like that? It's tough. It's tough. God experiences it with us. But he's a pretty good model, if you've noticed. Uh, one of my favorite verses that I don't like to be a favorite verse, but it's favorite because it's really so true. It says this in Hebrews. It says, all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but painful. But in the end, it produces the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So the work that Kathleen went through in her breakups and having to do the hard work, that's really painful to go through. But look what it produced, the ability to have a good relationship and a good marriage and overcome a bunch of stuff. And that's what we have to allow other people to do as well. Um, let's uh, see what is going on here. Um, uh, where are we? Um, probably got time. We're at the hour. We, uh, let's take one more. Who's next in line? Emily, who listens on Facebook, calling us from Pennsylvania. Emily, welcome to the Dr. Cloud Show. How can I help you? You got to go fast, Hi, though. Cloud. Sorry. Hey there. Oh, welcome. Well, okay, I'll try to be fast. Um, I actually um, have a hard time finding enjoyment in. I I actually had a pretty good forty years of my life. Uh, hold on, traumatic hold on, episode. hold on, hold on. I lost you. I heard okay. I have trouble finding enjoyment, and then you went silent. From my end. Oh, in my in my life. Um, in your life, I'm, I'm huh. very good. Yes, I I really don't enjoy life. <laughs> Um, I'm very mm. productive. Um, I do a lot of things and I do a lot of things for other people. Um, but when I went through a traumatic um, episode of my own, everyone abandoned me and I'm um, including mm. my church and my family and my friends. And so I feel kind of alone because I, I reached out for help and everyone <laughs> walked away from me and Wow. So I'm just what, trying to why Emily, why why would But I'm not doing a very away? good job. Why would people um, walk away? What well, what happened? I don't know. I well when baby girls in the womb and I'm sorry, um, what? I felt like I, you I the connection the, I'm sorry. I I lost two babies. Um before they were born. Oh, oh. You hear me? Yeah, I did. Are you are you on a headset by chance? No, no. No. Okay. I'm just on my phone, but um, and I felt like God was telling me um that you're a miracle and save them, and I don't know, I guess, what He actually said, but. It was very d disappointing to find out that's not how it turned out. Mm. And everyone just felt like I should move on from that. And nobody wanted to support me through it because I was too sad, according to them. Who and, was this? That um, was, who was this, this who was saying that? I mean, a miscarriage or, or, or you know, wherever and however. It, that, that is a very, very painful and can be traumatic event for some people. What? Who was saying that? I mean, who were these people? It, my family. Um, what is family? To together. Who, who, whose family? My parents. My parents and my siblings. Um, we used to all get together on Sundays, and I knew I wasn't supposed to isolate myself, so I would go. I wasn't obviously that much fun, but I didn't. <laughs> Does your family I normally, I does your family normally not good at processing pain and trauma and loss? Well, I didn't know that, but now looking back, yes, um, we, they apparently don't deal with those kind of things. Yeah. Um, okay. But so they, they failed you. Did, did you ever see a, like a professional counselor? I went to a couple of counselors, um, but they weren't overly helpful. And I don't know how to find a good one. Um, okay. I mean, um, the one counselor just told me to bury everything that I have in memory of those kids because they're gone. So what? I have to bury them and Are you on. kidding yes. me? I'm not. People have been so horrible. 
Just deny it, push it out of the way. Don't think about it. That was the answer you got. That's terrible, Emily. That's not how grief works. I'm so sorry. It's okay. Well, it's not okay. It hurts. It does. It st still hurts. Um, let me do something in the beginning here. And that is to tell you what you're feeling is pretty normal. Anybody ever tell you that? Um, not, not really. Just that I need to get over it. Okay, that's the that's probably it's it's not the problem. That's a big part of the problem. What if you had an infected finger? And somebody said, well, you know, get over it. It'll get better. It doesn't. It's got an infection in there. You got some pain. You got some loss. And especially sometimes in this particular kind of loss, it's connected to so many things for people. Everything that having a child represents, and it's connected to so many different things and so many sometimes different other pains, and it's got to be processed. Did I lose you? Well, that's why I wanted to talk to you. You seem very empathetic, and I'm having a hard time finding those that yeah. are. Okay. Well, that's what is really needed. And I would start, especially if it's been like you said, where you had concentric circles um, and your church has basically, is this one of those churches that kind of denies that things hurt and say victory in Jesus all the time? Um, yeah, we, we left the church that we were originally in. It was a small church because, well, my family mostly makes up the church, um, so they all believe. Oh, the same my thing. gosh. Listen we, to you. Emily, you're living in a closed circle of your family. It's not just your where you went to prostate. Come on. And then they're the church, and now that's your friends? Yeah. Well, Emily, I don't have any of them anymore. <laughs> well, we need – but let, let's don't go from there to a vacuum, right? <laughs> You need to try. Well, we went to a new church, but it's a, it's a big church. We just went there to hide. <laughs> okay, so well, that's good. That's Go hide. <laughs> but that's great. Fine. I'm so glad, really. I mean, you need sometimes to take cover. Proverbs, one of my favorite verses says, you know, the wise person sees danger and hides themselves. So you're seeing all this denial over here. You got to go hide somewhere, right? But usually yeah. within a big church, they also have, they also have, a list of vetted counselors in the town that aren't going to say stupid things to you. Hopefully they have probably some groups or sometimes maybe you can go to that church. Maybe there's another church in town that has some support groups. I want to see you. I want to see you in a group with other people that are grieving. That's what I would want you to be in a grief group. Well, you, I went to, some a support group that is actually for pregnancy and infant loss. But um, I had someone betray me in that group. Um, they went and yeah. told my family what I said in support group. Um, so hey, that, why did, why did, why did there. they, absolutely. Why did they know your family? See, we're back in the same problem. I don't know. We're, I don't know we're who back. it was or how they knew my family. Okay. But again, we're back in the same problem. The family overreach here, you keep mentioning church, support group, individually, Sunday get togethers, all of that. And we got to find a quarantined place for you away from the family dynamic. That's what I would want you to find. Okay. Sounds like the family, the family stuff with this particular loss, at least this one, maybe others. I'm so sorry, but you got to find some. How big a city do you live in? Um, I don't know. I'm not very good with numbers. It's a good sized city. I mean, is it um, over? Is it over half a million? Okay, maybe not. <laughs> All 
are you within driving distance to a big city that would have those kind of resources? Um, well, we're like two or two hours out from DC and Baltimore and okay. stuff like that. All right. I would just, I wouldn't give up on, here's your mission. Find a competent counselor and a competent group, A, that B, doesn't know your family. That's where <laughs> I would start. <laughs> All right. I got to run. I would, you know, try, try celebrate recovery called new life. Um, go talk to a pastor of pastoral care there and see what kind of groups they have. Just look around, but you're right. If there's danger in this system over here, you got to, as Proverbs says, you got to see danger and hide yourself, but you also need some help. And I want to validate for you that what you've gone through is a horrible, horrible loss and you should be feeling a lot of what you're feeling, but that also has answers and grief is resolvable. And that's what I want for you. Okay. I've got to, okay. I got to get moving. I hope that's helpful. I'm going to gift you um, all access to boundaries.me platform. And there are over 90 courses on there. And some of them are about grief and loss. And there's a good one there on, on depression and there's a good one good bunch of them there on people pickers and how you pick safe people and all of that so hope that helps you for the rest of you um we have a webinar coming up along with boundaries.me and a couple things about that it's called when your family hurts coming up november the 15th two-hour webinar we just heard it again when family hurts. Can you can you imagine going through that and your family saying, get over it? Some of you can. Some of you have family members, adult siblings or in-laws or grandmothers or mothers or adult, whatever it is. There's some family dynamics that can get painful. And we're going to talk about that as Thanksgiving and Christmas come up, especially on November 15th. Sign up for the family. Fixing Family Dynamics webinar. What's our official title? When Family Hurts. That's right. Breaking Destructive Patterns. I never know how to put these words together because it, it, I just know it hurts, right? But we got to name it something, so that's what we named it. But we're going to talk about all that November 15th. Go to boundaries.me forward slash family to sign up for that. And if you can't see it live, you can stream it afterwards. Get a small group together. Watch it on your own. It's all yours to do however you want. And for the rest of you, go to boundaries.me and check it out. We have many, many courses there that you get full access to just by becoming a subscriber. All righty, guys, we will um, be here again. Um, somebody is typing a message here to me. That's maybe, hang on. If they got something for me, I'm supposed to tell you. I got to tell you. You guys can't see this, but I see typing going on. Uh, no, we're all good. Okay, we'll be here tomorrow. If we didn't get to you today, call me back. You guys rock, by the way. The way you support each other on Facebook and YouTube and Instagram. And some of you listen on the podcast. You can download the show as a podcast. And you support each other. And um, that's what this is all about. We are a tribe going through this journey together. And we'll keep doing it. Send us your feedback.